Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome Bitcoin historian Pete Rizzo. Pete is also working with Bitcoin Magazine as well as the Exchange Kraken. Pete, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Pete, we are airing this on April 5th, 2024. It is Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday. But how can Satoshi mm. have a birthday when Satoshi is an alias? Explain to us the background behind April 5th, how did Satoshi come up mm -hmm. with his own birthday? What does it mean? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of theory and speculation on this. First of all, you know, happy birthday to Satoshi out there. Uh, 49 by his own his own declaration. And yeah, this is one of the few things uh, we know, right? Satoshi Nakamoto, while a pseudonym that was used to uh, kind of author the white paper, uh, you know, did interact as an online persona out there on the internet, right? So under this alias, um, you know, he created uh, personas on different email addresses and forums, right? And so in this case, in order to be uh, a member of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation Forum, so this would have been a sort of technology forum for people who are working on peer-to-peer -peer technologies, it's, uh, you know, a domain of Bitcoin, you would have had to create a profile. So in this case, Satoshi would have had to identify as a he, uh, he would have had to kind of list his name and his birth date. Uh, and the birth date that uh, he listed was April 5th, uh, let me get the, get the date right, 1975, right? And so there's a bunch Bunch of you know from there kind of uh you know I, ideas and illusions about what it what it all means i think one of the most popular ones is that uh 1975 it was the date that they kind of uh, re-allowed gold after the 6102 event so the u.s citizens could hold gold uh, again legally in the united states that's a popular theory other uh, you know, things that it's been linked to April 5th, also the birthday of Nick Zabo, who's a kind of early cryptographer and cypherpunk. Uh, so, you know, now you're into sort of the numerology and mythology of Satoshi, maybe passing out of the facts. Uh, but, you know, factually, uh, this is what Satoshi said. It was, it was his birthday. And uh, I think we got to respect that, right? The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by River. Make sure to check out river.com today or the link below in the description. River is our preferred place to purchase Bitcoin. Now, when you're buying Bitcoin, guys, there are several considerations. Number one, should I be using an exchange? Is the exchange custodying their own Bitcoin? Is the exchange using platforms to custody that we don't know? Is the exchange leveraging its Bitcoin for other purposes? Well, with River, we know that River does not use leverage of any kind. River also uses its own multi-sig solution so that your Bitcoin are not held by anybody else. So it's a very important thing to understand about what River offers. Now, River also has Lightning Network integration and a lot of other really exciting features. Go check out river.com today. So let's talk about Executive Order 6102. And then in 1975, that order being removed. So is the theory here that Bitcoin and gold are from the Satoshi Nakamoto side intended to be similar, grouped in the same category? And how do you view this link with Executive Order 6102? Yeah, look, I think it's speculative, right? Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, if you kind of examine his writings, of which there are a lot, right? This year, there's been a couple big moments. They've had new emails kind of released 150 pages of, of documentation about Satoshi, how he's thought about the project, how he handled it. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's been a resurgence of late over the last maybe four or five years in kind of Austrian economics and kind of an economic domain thinking kind of applied to Bitcoin. And I think, you know, there's been a rise of this theory kind of kind of in line with that. Um, you know, if you look at Satoshi's writings, just his actual text, um, you know, very little of it is actually, you know, on economics. Right. So he doesn't you know, really reference many textbooks on economics. Uh, he doesn't really uh, maybe even talk so much about his theory behind the economics of Bitcoin. Right. So one of the things that came out in the emails this year, but it was actually kind of revealed in a previous developer who had published his emails with that was that, you know, Satoshi really saw 21 million Bitcoin as an educated guess, right? Like that's his, his justification, uh, you know, where he was say, oh, there's 8 million people uh, and 21 million coins sort of feels right, right? So we know that Satoshi was, you know, maybe a bit of a pragmatist, right? He, he had, he didn't really have any, have that much absolute uh 
kind of absolutism behind his ideas. But um, yeah, certainly there's a popular theory here that likes to promote the idea that, you know, essentially Bitcoin is kind of this new alternative digital gold. It promotes, you know, your ability to hold your own wealth and custody via your private keys. And, you know, Executive Order 6102 within the, you know, pantheon of economic history is an event where the United States government essentially via President Roosevelt, uh, you know, essentially banned private citizens from owning gold, right? So this was a period of economic instability. They just had the roaring 20s, the kind of the stock market boom of the late 1920s. All of that disintegrated. You had millions of people homeless, adrift. There was mass political kind of uprisings. And you really saw kind of a uh, you know, reforming of the economy under a central planning and central management, right? So this would have been in the wake of some of John Keynes and his formative works, you know, probably pre prior to Hayek and some of, you know, his more popular works, Road to Serfdom's not out yet at this time, but really, you know, A Treatise on Money uh, and Credit was really the kind of big book, right? John Keynes was the big economic mind at the time. And, you know, FDR kind of as a politician looking for a solution to the problem, you know, really adopts a lot of this kind of central planning mindset, right? And you do really see the United States in the 1930s transition, you know, from what some people would argue was a free market economy with a free market for private monies, you know, even though there was a Federal Reserve into a system where the economy was central planned. So I think, you know, people like to link these two dates uh, because it allows us to kind of talk about all these reasons why Bitcoin is relevant today, right? In a day where governments are overreaching and people feel like they need to preserve their wealth. Now, Pete, I want to first remind the viewers here that it is not our intention in any way to specifically try to identify the uh, identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. That is not my goal. It's not our goal here today. Our Approach is from the curiosity side and the understanding of Bitcoin's origins. So I want to start with just reminding people about that. Now, with that being said, there is a wide belief that Satoshi Nakamoto was this cypherpunk who had come from a deep cryptography background and was somebody who was trying to solve decentralized money trying to solve the Byzantine general's problem and was able to accomplish that did so anonymously so because the idea was potentially bigger than the person itself now we have that school of thought but we also have this lingering idea that satoshi nakamoto is an intelligence product because the nsa invented sha 256 so i want to ask you about Maybe if you can just give your opinion on why people think that Satoshi is an intelligence product, what mm. is the link with SHA-256, and give us a sense mm. of history there so that we can learn from you. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, that's not a theory that I've directly explored, like in, in any degree, right? Because there isn't a lot of contextual evidence for that, right? So I think one of the reasons people like to bring that up is because, you know, the National Security Agency, NSA, is, you know, sort of the domain, uh, you know, a body within the United States government that would have essentially managed cryptography, right? Or had an interest in cryptography. Uh, and this kind of lingering perception goes back to the 1990s during like the crypto wars. And I hear, I think I'm going to be a little bit fuzzy on the specifics, but the generalities are essentially, you know, the US government did attempt to mandate uh, and bring encryption under, you know, regulations such a, that it was that no private citizen could actually experiment with this, right? So this was kind of the big conflict of the early days of the cypherpunks. Uh, and, you know, Satoshi, I think, well, we don't know that he was an explicitly a member of the cypherpunks, certainly venerates that group, right? He makes a number of specific textual allusions to thanking people who are part of that group, Hal Finney, Zuko Wilcox, uh, you know, people who he saw as, you know, kind of forefathers and part of that. I, you know, I do think I get the sense more recently that Satoshi might be a little younger, especially from these new emails that have come out where he speaks a little bit more colloquially with some, you know, euphemisms that maybe, maybe you wouldn't have heard from an older person. But yeah, I think uh, essentially, you know, you have this idea that uh, the United States government was heavily interested in cryptography. Cryptography was seen as this domain of munitions, this domain of warfare. Uh, and the cypherpunks were the civilian group that really, you know, attempted to erode that and did successfully erode that, right? So Phil Zimmerman and pretty good, uh, pretty good privacy PGP, which would have been the kind of encryption standard. If you send encrypted emails today, that's what it uses. Um, that would have been their battle, right? So the Adam backs of the world, you know, had kind of fought the crypto wars, the crypto wars, you know, essentially allowed cryptography to be experimented on by civilians and researchers. 
Uh, and I think Satoshi would have, you know, uh, had that connection. And I think people, you know, suspect that there's a connection there again, because the NSA would have been, you know, essentially the opposing group. It would have had a number of researchers on its side who were probably just as schooled in cryptography as the cypherpunks. Uh, and, you know, especially because Satoshi does seem like an academic, right? That's one of the kind of constant illusions about his work. You have things like the double spaces in his, you know, typing, right? Where the people think that that's an illusion to maybe that he used a typewriter and might have been older. There's the academic style of his the release of the paper. Uh, whereas, you know, on the cryptography mailing list uh, and the cypherpunk mailing list, things would have been more informal, right? So if you kind of look at some of these early digital cash projects, they're released under pseudonyms, but sometimes they're funny names. It's not like its own document, right? It's it's essentially, you know, these are people who are in their nights and weekends are working on something that they find interesting uh, for, you know, a certain goal, a societal goal, uh, but they're maybe not as well trained, whereas I think is the illusion that people think is that Satoshi comes off as someone who had a more formal academic training. Uh, and so I would want to point viewers and listeners to two things. First, we did an episode a month ago on the new Satoshi emails that Pete is referring to. So I'd recommend mm. people go check that out. The emails between Satoshi and Marty are the ones that we get really into. So that's a great episode. People really enjoyed that for some good Bitcoin history. The next thing I want to recommend is for people to go check out this book. Aaron Van Weerdem mm. has written a fantastic Bitcoin history. I'm using it in my book research right now. And a lot of the stories that Pete is talking about, that early pre-Bitcoin history, Aaron does a brilliant job in this book. So I'd recommend people go check right. this out. Now, Pete, you bring up PGP with Zimmerman. Hal Finney was mm. a member of that project or helped on that project. Uh -huh. We learned that, I, well, I learned from this, uh, the Genesis book, that when DigiCash failed, that Adam mm. Back was right in there in the forums talking about why don't we try something that's independent from the banking mm. system that we have its own network. It, mm. it, it's, it's unbelievable to me to continually read how all these ideas were bubbling up. And then you mentioned Sabo's mm. birthday and we think about Bitgold. So let's talk about Sabo and Back for a second. Th mm. the inspiration behind Bitcoin and Satoshi's reference to and uh, association with. And then let's also throw Wei Dai in there because um, mm. I just want to bring this up real quickly. I had a conversation recently with uh, Dhruv Bonsal, the founder of Unchained. Mm. And Dhruv was under the, or he had this thesis that Satoshi had read Wei Dai's paper and had picked a scarcity amount as the final solution plus the way die paper. But we learned maybe that Satoshi hadn't been aware of that paper. So I'm, I'm asking you a bunch of things, but maybe you can just react yeah. <laughs> in, in um, like how Satoshi associated mm. with these, with these other cypherpunks during that era of pre Bitcoin mm. and the beginning uh, weeks and months of Bitcoin. Yeah, so I like to break down the early period of Bitcoin and to essentially or sorry, prehistory of Bitcoin, and especially with the cypherpunks in the three eras. And first, I would say, yeah, definitely read the Genesis book. I had an opportunity to kind of look at some early drafts of that. Fantastic stuff. It's going to go out into this in a lot more detail. But um, yeah, first, like, you know, the idea of electronic cash and, and kind of digital cash really starts with David John. So this would have been in the 1980s. This would have, you know, post dated things like public key cryptography, which is really the founding invention. So at this time, essentially, the Internet is still really the domain of universities, right? You know, if you're using it, you're kind of a young person, you work, you know, with your professor. It's still something that a few people are working on. It isn't widespread and integrated into cultural life as it would be in the 1990s. And you really start to see a few researchers start to get worried about this. They're essentially like, well, hey, what are the societal ramifications of everyone passing all this information? What can you, who can learn things about me and what can they learn? And David Chom is really kind of the founding fig figure, right? And he, I think it's important to note, really does invent a working digital cash, right? A lot of his early papers and essentially what he, you know, commercializes in DigiCash was a functioning digital cash system, right? This is something where you could have downloaded a wallet, you could have sent it 
uh, you know, this this uh, currency to others. But the uh, network was essentially centralized, right? It was run by banks and merchants, right? And so all of the stuff that he patented and commercialized and all of his inventions was around this idea that, you know, these new digital networks that we would have for money would very much replicate the existing system. So I think people, especially who see Chom kind of like interact with the kind of crypto ecosystem today, and they're kind of confused. Oh, I thought Chom was a cypherpunk. Why is he kind of interested in these kind of like more, uh, you know, cryptocurrency non-Bitcoin ideas? I think it's important to understand Chom was very interested in replicating the uh, traditional banking system within a digital realm, right? And so with Chom, you get decades of work that really are foundational for Bitcoin, but they're all patented, right? They're all sold to banks and sold to, you know, large organizations that he expected to run and operate the software. So I think as you alluded to in the mid 90s with Adam Back and the cypherpunks, um, you know, they really start to get dissatisfied with this. Uh, one of the funny kind of historical notes is if you look at actually where the patents of, you know, David Chom's work expires is they expire in 2007. Satoshi in 2009 kind of claims that he'd been working on Bitcoin for a couple of years, right? So there was this idea that there was this domain of kind of knowledge and research this, this domain of knowledge research was patented. And by the kind of mid to late 90s, there begins this sense, if you go through the cypherpunk kind of emails that, hey, can we find a work away around this? Like, yeah, sure, this guy has all these patents, but like maybe we should just build our own thing and that own thing could be better. And so that idea that they have is really formed around this idea of peer-to-peer -peer networks, which really are kind of the late 90s trend and then really commercialized with BitTorrent. So if you think about something like Napster, uh, LimeWire, kind of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, this would have been like late 90s, early 2000s. So by then very widespread. So by the mid 90s, peer-to-peer -peer technologies are understood. There's bleeding edge. People are interested in them. And there's this idea of, hey, how can we blend some of these digital cash cryptography ideas that Chom had with peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? Peer-to-peer -peer foundation. Why did Satoshi go to the peer-to-peer -peer foundation forum? Because these are the people who were kind of interested in this stuff. Uh, and then there's the economic piece, right? And that's where Adam Back's big contribution with Hashcash is. Um, as we're recording this, it's the anniversary of his publication of Hashcash, the paper 27 years ago, uh, where he essentially tried to apply proof of work to a currency, right? Uh, and so there was this idea, I think, by the late 90s, the cypherpunks had a few different pieces. They had Chom's historical cryptography work. They had this idea that peer-to-peer -peer networks and you know this idea that, hey, rather than giving banks and merchants power, what if everybody ran this network? What if it was a collective network? And they had some aspect of economics, right? Oh, well, hey, well, maybe we should back this currency with some sort of computer network or computer resource. That's kind of Adam Back's unique contribution. But even then, I think even though all the pieces to get are together, you still kind of have a decade of, of failures after that, where there's still, you know, I think people lose interest in the idea. It falls off. The number of even like public mailing lists where people are discussing this goes way down. And essentially you have, you know, a few people like Wei Dai, you mentioned Nick Zabo, Hal Finney, who privately blog about this. They have their own private mailing lists, um, but they're not publicly discussing it anymore, right? It just becomes very unfashionable, right? The world kind of moves on. DigiCash has failed. There's been these efforts to commercialize digital money, but for most purposes, right, SSL works. Like I'm entering my credit card information into websites, and this is really how the web scales, right? The web, uh, you know, while I think the inventors of the web really thought e-cash was necessary by the late 90s you know people are onboarding to the web credit cards are widespread https begins to kind of encrypt web traffic and things take off right e-commerce is into the millions mobile commerce into the billions and these ideas kind of get forgotten right except by a few people who kind of kept this light alive and that's why i think there's such a strong connotation uh, that one of these figures was involved or multiple multiple of them were involved um and I think it's in the case of Hal Finney, it's safe to say he was pretty much involved, right? Like he didn't author the white paper and he didn't write the code, but, you know, he was talking to Satoshi prior to the launch of Bitcoin and, and seems to have an impact on some of its final design decisions. So for all intents and purposes, you know, someone who was in the, in the realm of open source software contributing to Bitcoin. It's so fascinating. Um, there's so many you know, questions and uh, there's such a mystery behind it, but it, it's part of what makes Bitcoin so interesting. There's something that I read in one of the emails that I haven't been able to forget. And it's when Satoshi said that 
actually invented smart contracts years ago. What do you, what does that mean to you? How do you interpret that, that email that he sent? I can't remember if it was a post for a uh, forum post or an email where he's like, actually what you're talking about, these agreements, I invented something like that, you know, a long time ago, I've been working on things like yeah. that for a long time. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, look, Satoshi, if you go back to his writings, you know, cryptography is not a science that advances at a particularly fast rate, right? One of the, my favorite colloquialisms about cryptography is that, you know, with, with other technologies, they progress, they can move fast, they can move fast and brace things. But when you break cryptography, it's like breaking a lock. It's broken forever, right? When the United States government broke the Nazi code, when they broke that cryptography, it was broken. There was no way for the kind of you know, German war machine to, to re-encrypt, you know, what they had. So they had this, they, there's this idea that um, uh, cryptography moves slow and it doesn't particularly advance. And so a lot of the things that you, th that we think of as cutting edge today, I'll give you an example, zero knowledge proofs, right? Very cutting edge today. A lot of these kind of newer Bitcoin L2s, quasi L2s, you know, are, are playing around this technology and it feels very futuristic. You can find Hal Finney giving presentations about <laughs> zero knowledge proofs in the mid '90s, right? Satoshi was someone who, you know, was familiar with this technology. Smart contracts being the same, which is this idea that we can automate the agreement of exchange between individuals, right? So a lot of these concepts, you know, while we like to think, or I guess you know, certain parts of the cryptocurrency industry like to think that they are very new and and potentially there are applications that are new. Uh, there's this kind of long-standing struggle, much in the same way as with Bitcoin, right? Like there there was a foundational group of ideas as I mentioned, that the cypherpunks had, but really, you know, it can take a long time for things to come together. Um, so when I hear things like that, you know, I'm not particularly surprised, right? Like the the concepts here are, are all things that were pretty well discussed uh, on the mailing list at that time, because, you know, the cypherpunks were a much broader group than really being interested in digital cash, right? They were... And I think it's interesting because of some of the cultural attributes we think of as Bitcoiners today, you know, the cypherpunks were very California, left-leaning, super futuristic, you know, we're going to cryopreserve our bodies and we're going to figure out how to get to space and like terraform <laughs> Mars. You know, they were, these were people who were like radically thinking about how to bring about the science fiction that they had grown up really, not just science, right? It's how do we push science, um, you know, into the realm of kind of the experimental that they had grown up with, right? Hal writes a lot about his favorite science fiction works, this, you know, the future societies where anonymity is under threat, uh, where government, you know, is, is sort of this, you know, large kind of digital overlord, right? So they, they, they basically, um, you know, they had a wide set of ideas that they were interested in and the society that they wanted to bring about was larger than a digital cash. Uh, but it's certainly that they saw that as core to that because digital cash to them meant privacy. It meant anonymity. It meant this ability to kind of resist state actors and resist what they saw as this draconian future, right, that they wanted to prevent. Yeah. And as I'm going through a lot of the history as well myself, I'm discovering really how California originated many of these ideas were and that people came from around the world england and the midwest the east coast to california to study at the universities in california to be part of the internet at the beginning ucla usc i was surprised to find out that my own university usc is has a role in some of the early extropian and cypherpunk uh, students. So any comments just mm. on California's influence here in that extropian era, if you could uh, explain to people uh, or associate that with what you were talking about with the science fiction pursuit. Yeah, yeah. sure. I think like um, I would say that the cypherpunks, while a specific, you know, sociological group, right, they do coincide with the wider kind of early worldwide web founders, right? So essentially by the late 80s, early 90s, this is when the web really goes mainstream, right? With the Mosaic browser, 
you have dial up internet. It goes from something that is, you know, a campus affair, you maybe you're emailing your professors to widespread kind of an everyday life. People are surfing the web, it becomes very colloquial. But there is a kind of very interesting sociological overlap where the kind of progenitors of those fields were kind of tightly linked, right? They would have been people who were talking about the cutting edge of science and people who were interested in advancing it. So, you know, some person, uh, somebody who I think is not associated with digital cash, but really actually, if you kind of look at their, you know, past uh, kind of writings and, and talks is Tim Berners-Lee, right? He's kind of the godfather of the web. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things is that, that I found in kind of my research recently is that at the first World Wide Web event that Tim Berners-Lee held, he gave the keynote presentation to Dave Chum, right? And the reason that he did that is because he actually thought it was so important that the web have its own digital cache, like because of the privacy anonymity, that he at his own conference, even though he invented the web, <laughs> was willing to kind of give the floor to somebody else because his understanding was, hey, you know, we have to get this next generation you know, to care about these ideas and care about these principles. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a, a side effect of the web is that the web culture really ends up rejecting the cypherpunks. It's, and I think that's a, a bit of a tragedy, right? Is that in order to move fast and grow, uh, the web kind of grows, you know, uh, into a bit of an, it's an anarchic process, right? You know, they try to kind of create these forums like W3C and these kind of consortias that kind of maybe manage some of these things. But for the most part, these are young kids with computers with ideas that they're getting out as fast as they're coming out of their head. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, like Chom and the Hal Finneys and the kind of the cypherpunks, you know, there's a reason that they're a subculture of that group, right? While they have endured because their writing is very prophetic and it deals with a lot of issues that we still deal with today, you know, they very much become a group that, you know, isn't culturally mainstream, right? When you think of, you know, who are the figures associated with the 90s internet in California, it's people like Mark Andreessen, people like uh, Chris Dixon, like the kind of people who are, you know, today maybe not so associated with Bitcoin, right? And I think that's because there's historical tensions between those groups dating back decades. And it's not just digital cash, it's also open source, you know, versus free software, right? There's all these kind of cultural schisms within technology. And, you know, Bitcoin inherits a lot of that, right? Bitcoin is the product of, of some of these subcultures. Uh, and, uh, you know, it does exist in the face of them, right? It, it, it does contradict them. And, uh, you know, that's been part of the reason I think why, you know, so many people within the tech industry, it still takes them a long time to understand Bitcoin, right? They're not teaching the, the cypherpunks uh, in computer science classes, right? They're, they're not uh, the people who are taught for, for better or for worse. And the history of open source and the growth of Linux over time is, un it's not well understood. It's not as widely understood as it could be. And in that we find a difficulty in emphasizing the importance of open source and why Bitcoin is open source and why that is, is so important. Can you tell us one more time, Pete, this keynote speech that you're referring to um, mm. addressing David Chum, what year was that? And, and, and what was the setting of that? Can you tell us one more time? Mm. Yeah. So this would have been like 1994. I think this was early nineties, 92 to 94. This would have been the first World Wide web summit. So essentially Tim Berners Lee, the inventor of the web would have, you know, this would have been the first time that he had a conference. <laughs> so he invited everybody to CERN in Switzerland where they have the big particle collider. Uh, and, you know, people would have come from all over the world and rode buses and stayed in hotels. And they would have come to this, you know, these dinky little rooms and whiteboards uh, to say, you know, how are we going to construct the consumer internet, right? What do we need to build? And they sort of had two or three days of whiteboard sessions where, you know, they put the full suite of ideas, you know, here's digital cash, here's, uh, you know, uh, cyber worlds where, you know, there's 3D virtual reality and uh, people 3D printing things, right? Like this whole, their design space was massive, right? So you would have had people at that conference who are talking about things that today are still like unrealized, right? There's another keynote by a guy uh, named Mark Pesci who kind of like is talking about virtual worlds. Like he's like, oh, I want to build, you know, VR settings where you won't have web pages. You'll you'll be physically walking to like a house and the house will have data in it and you can own parts of this world, right? Like so the ideas are just all over the place, right? The web is really, uh, and I think that's a testament to how fast the web grew, right? Because essentially, 
you know, you, you think about the web really from like the late eighties, uh, to the early nineties. And it's important to understand the web is just one kind of internet technology, right? But it's the one that kind of tied them all together and it sort of grows very fast, right? All this stuff kind of comes together and it becomes the way that you kind of search the hypertext world that unites everything. Uh, so they had this idea that things were just, just growing at a really, you know, uh, kind of out of hands, but yeah, this, this conference would have essentially been the summit for that. And David Chom would have given them the keynote and his keynote would have been directly about digital cash. And he would have actually demonstrated the first working digital cash payment, which was an e-cash payment from himself to like a, a bank, like within the, the digital cash system. But I, I guess I use that as an example to say, you know, these cultures, while they diverge, they originally kind of had a similar combined intent, right? Like the founders of both movements would have shared values of anonymity and privacy and uh, wanting to figure out how to commercialize the stuff. And though they kind of diverge eventually, uh, there is that moment kind of at the beginning. And I think it's just a testament to how, you know, they saw it was important, right? Well, it was ultimately something unrealized by that group of people. Uh, they still aspirationally wanted to achieve that, right? It just took a lot longer. Pete, uh, we have the release of these emails, thanks to the Craig Wright case. We have new information coming out. But I'm curious, as a Bitcoin historian, now where we stand today, what are you interested in? What are you researching more hmm. about Bitcoin's history? What is driving your work now, standing Bitcoin 15 and a half years old almost? Uh, heading into the fourth having, what are you doing as a Bitcoin researcher? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I work on is unpublished uh, so far. Um, you know, I really, I think the goal for me is to establish the people and events who are relevant to Bitcoin and why. So I call this a historiography, right? So what is a, what is a history, right? Like when you're writing history, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, you're really trying to, I think, isolate the people who are involved you know, after the launch of Bitcoin, who are principally relevant in building this kind of ideology we have, and then to sort of identify the events and the kind of timeline, uh, you know, of how that um, drama unfolded. Because I think it's important to understand that Satoshi doesn't really leave a completed Bitcoin. I don't. I don't think so. Um, you know, and I'll give the the one reason I like to give is that essentially, you know, while Satoshi was the lead maintainer of Bitcoin and did, you know, kind of rule Bitcoin as essentially a benevolent monarch, even he didn't have an understanding of what a Bitcoin that was kind of managed by an open source uh, kind of community really looked like, right? He inherited sort of governance problems that existed in open source and open source really the only model was this lead developer, benevolent dictator type model. Uh, and there wasn't a solution to that, right? So there were certain aspects of Bitcoin that needed to be kind of built out and fleshed out by the generation that came after, right? The people who took up Satoshi's invention and moved it forward. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time trying to isolate, okay, um, how did the ideas that we have about Bitcoin really form? So for an example, we have this idea that Bitcoin is sovereign, right? That, that it, it gives us sovereignty. And that's a very specific term, right? Like that, that, that means something very specific. Uh, and you can kind of trace these different words and terminologies back to certain people and individuals. And what you'll find, I think, a lot of times is that, you know, these ideas that we have that feel very mainstream, they're part of our culture. They come from unique individuals who had outsider ideas about how Bitcoin worked, right? And there are I still think today, even within Bitcoin, warring tensions over how Bitcoin should develop. Um, you know, and I think one of the classic kind of um, divisions that we're seeing playing out right now is I think, you know, there's this question about, you know, what is what is Bit what are we trying to achieve with Bitcoin, right? What is Bitcoin maximalism, maybe, if, if you want to think about it like that? Um, what is our stance towards the cryptocurrency apparatus outside of Bitcoin, right? And there's a lot of historical attitude changes towards that. Um, I would essentially say that the sociological group within Bitcoin largely has two attitudes, right? They, one, think that everything is a scam and that it will fail. Or two, they think that the destiny of Bitcoin is to reappropriate all these technologies. And to the extent that they're capable of being realized, to realize them on the Bitcoin in some way. Well, obviously, those are two radically different views. <laughs> uh, and while both of those camps are sort of aligned on this vision of seeing Bitcoin as the only kind of large scale digital cash project, the only kind of internet of money that will be kind of used by the world, uh, they have very different 
worldviews about how that will be achieved, and thus they come into disagreement about any number of other factors. So, you know, for myself, I think it's really trying to understand, okay, like what are the different um, sociologies within Bitcoin, right? Like what do different Bitcoiners believe and to what extent are those coherent theories? And then to what extent are they coherent theories? Like who is responsible for them and what was that contribution? I'll give you an example. So somebody I've been spending a lot of time researching recently is Peter Todd. Um, he's somebody you may know from the Bitcoin development community, uh, but he's someone who I think has made very authentic and original contributions to Bitcoin. And his essential, I think, contribution was that, you know, decentralization was the, you know, founding value proposition of Bitcoin. It is what differentiates Bitcoin from every other internet monetary system that was ever invented. And while that seems very commonplace now, it's like not in any way controversial for me to say that decentralization is what drives Bitcoin's value and what's, it's what differentiates it from every digital cash project. Uh, you know, it was very controversial at the time. It actually ran in the face of the lead developer of the project, Gavin Andreessen, who did not believe that at all, who actually saw users uh, as driving the value of Bitcoin and security of Bitcoin and was willing to make great sacrifices to decentralization in order to achieve what he thought was like a p political security of the project outside of government enforcement. So, you know, this is kind of a foundational clash within the Bitcoin story. And I think while some people might know these figures, they don't really know to what extent the disagreement was. They don't understand it. And they might know one version of the, this event. They might have some piece of it. Uh, they maybe don't have that kind of full story of, you know, Peter Todd being this outsider person with a very original idea, that idea being assimilated into the culture. And then, you know, I think like even today, people might be more familiar with like, oh, Peter Todd, isn't he that guy who proposed that we like, you know, uh, maybe uh, have a long tail inflation for Bitcoin? You know, he's not a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, and I would say, well, uh, I think he is. I think he's someone who has a very specific and very well-developed thesis for Bitcoin. Uh, and in this case, you know, he sees the decentralization of Bitcoin as so important uh, that he is willing to sacrifice, you know, some of the economic purity of the network in order to make sure that Bitcoin succeeds. So, yeah, I find that to be a very interesting idea. Again, I don't know whether I agree with it. I don't know that I have to agree with it, uh, but I think that we don't know what we agree on or don't agree on if we don't have a nice specificity on what the different views are. So I think a lot of, you know, the current Bitcoin culture is very focused on kind of tarring and feathering ideas that are outside the kind of consensus mainstream. And I think that's sad because I think if there's if there's one overwhelming takeaway from the Bitcoin history, it's that the real kind of ideas that have stuck within the culture were very much fringe ideas. That's pretty much inarguable. If you if you go down the list of like most of the things that we think about modern Bitcoin, they were at one time views that were held as by as few as one person. <laughs> and so that gives me a lot of sympathy for ideas that are controversial and it makes me want to understand them uh, and it makes me want to understand where they come from and to find a way to kind of, you know, give people a framework for these views uh, so that they're not threatening, right? I think a lot of people, when they come to Bitcoin for the first time, they there's a natural kind of tension, right? You, you invest money in the Bitcoin project and then you hope that there's an economic return for that investment. And I think a lot of new Bitcoiners kind of are given a very specific way that they're kind of told that Bitcoin is. Uh, and the reality is that the Bitcoin thesis and ideology have, have been in a flux since the creation of Bitcoin, right? There's been different people who are warring over the idea of what Bitcoin is, how its value proposition is derived. And because of that, um, I think that there's a danger in that, right? There's there's some groups that kind of get stuck in certain ideologies. And of course, that we know some of them because they exist on the fringes of Bitcoin, right? The VSV people or the Bitcoin Cash people, right? Um, and I think that, um, yeah, we still lack a really consistent framework to examine these different ideas. And I, and I still think that there's a, yeah, I wish there was more willingness to kind of approach some of these outsider topics, because I do think that, again, like Bitcoin, the, the sort of Bitcoin ideology or like our mainstream understanding of it, like really has changed quite considerably. Well, you are in a unique position, Pete, because as a Bitcoin historian of a technology that's only 15 years old, you have decades of work ahead of you, and we are <laughs> excited to follow along. Pete Rizzo, 
Bitcoin historian. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin layer. Please tell people where they can find your ongoing work. Sure. Uh, Twitter at Pete underscore Rizzo underscore. I do a daily uh, Bitcoin history post. You'll also find kind of long form threads on kind of the formative figures that I was talking about in the Bitcoin history. And uh, stay tuned. Might be some more content coming out on that vein in the future. So we're excited, Pete. Thank you for joining us and we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for having me. Special thanks to River for sponsoring this channel. Purchase Bitcoin without any fees when you use River's DCA feature. River has become our trusted source of accessing the Bitcoin market because they don't use any third party custodians. This is a very, very important thing to understand. River is not using another company to store the Bitcoin for them. They have their own multi-signature solutions, which means that they have designed their own way to make sure nobody else has responsibility for the Bitcoin for the time that you have River hold your Bitcoin for you on their platform once you have purchased it. So go check out river.com today. Thanks for sticking with us as always at the Bitcoin layer. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our Substack at the bitcoinlayer.substack.com so that you can follow along our latest research and analysis. Mm -hmm.